How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Soccer X TV. We have a special guest today, Tom Penn, CEO of San Diego FC. Thanks for joining us, Tom. My pleasure. So you guys just had a very new and exciting Crest launch. Uh, how did that come to be, and how did you decide to end up with that look and style? Yeah, it was a fun event. Friday night, we had 8,000 people register to come. There were at least 5,000 there, so it was sold out in 40 minutes. Just kind of a frenzy here in town around their excitement of this club. Um, you know, it was a lot of buildup. It was seven months of work where we engaged with all facets of the community. You know, we did focus groups. We did one-on-one -on -one interviews, hundreds of hours of conversations. We talked to influencers. We talked to people that really knew this community because, frankly, I'm not from this community. And while our main owners uh, here locally, Saquon, the Native American tribe, they're indigenous to the land, right? So nobody gets more local than them. Uh, but us in management were coming from out of town. So we thought it was really important to engage our audience and learn what San Diego is all about because we wanted a mark that would represent the essence of this community. And when I say this community, it's not just the city or it's not just the coast. It's not what I thought of San Diego as an outsider. The chairman of the Saquon tribe said to me at the very beginning, Tom, whatever we do, let's find out, let's create something that brings the whole community together, including the East County. You know, it's a really distinct place here. We want to weave it all together. So that's the symbol we came up with, the flow, which weaves 18 lines representing the 18 cities in San Diego County together as one. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's fascinating. So you said 8,000 fans there. How do you go about building a fan base from absolute scratch, even though there are other so many other teams and you know, people are fans of European teams? How do you build a fan base from the from the ground up? Yeah, in this case, uh, this is a unique community. It's over 3 million people. And then when you cross into Mexico, it gets doubles. So it's about 6 million in the actual sort of joint area. And there's a real binationality to this zone. So when you factor in 3 million plus people, there's only one professional team here in the men's side, and that's the San Diego Padres. So one major league professional team. The San Diego Chargers, the American football team, recently left and broke everybody's heart. So we're here to sort of fill that void. And we have this opportunity to appeal to the entire region in a way that, you know, is, is quite interesting. Uh, my last experience was in Los Angeles with LAFC. And in that case, we were the 10th professional team into that market. There were there's two of everything. Uh, and in this case... We have this chance to appeal to all of San Diego and be really relevant. So that's how we at least establish our initial uh, presence. And now it's up to us to earn the trust of all these fans that want and supporters that want to be a part of this club. And that just happens over time as we engage with them, as we listen to them, and as we build momentum towards our first match in the spring of 2025. So you spoke about building that kind of community and things like that. Um, how does the club plan on using the next few years of excitement leading up to 2026? There's a lot of tournaments going to be in the United States. How do you think that you might be able to convert maybe some of the casual fans that are experiencing maybe the game for the first time uh, and bring them into your community as you launch in 2025? Well, look, once we're playing in 2025, we're going to convert a lot of people the way I was converted. I call myself the enlightened American fan, and there are a lot of us. You know, I was deep into basketball. I was deep into all the American sports, and I went to a Portland Timbers game with my kids. And it's still the screensaver on my wife's phone. It's her with those kids back in 2011. And I went to a Timbers game, and I heard the Timbers army roaring, and I was like, whoa. I had no idea that happened here. My kids looked up at me starry-eyed and said, Daddy, this is awesome. And I was like, this is awesome. So I didn't know that was happening here in America. And that's when it was becoming a thing. So at LAFC, the 3252 roared to life. You've seen the same thing in Austin and St. Louis. So as supporter culture is becoming even more cool and well-known here, all those that haven't seen that in this region are going to go to one of our matches and they're going to be like, whoa, 
wow. So that is an immediate conversion for anyone. And when you talk about a March to 2026, you know, there's a lot that happens between now and then. In 2024, we're going to build our community, build our relationships with everyone. We've got some organized things we're going to do community by community. We have a cool Chrome ball that we use that has every community's name on it. We're going to activate in each community. And then we're going to start announcing players after the first of the year. And we're just going to get into a rhythm of news and information and momentum. And then we start playing in 25. So by 26, when the World Cup comes, it should be really awesome. So you were talking a bit about growing the team, what's going to go into it. I wanted to touch on the Right to Dream uh, community. Obviously, San Diego is part of that, and there also comes an academy structure and all the things. For people who don't know what Right to Dream is, can you explain a bit about the organization and how San Diego is a part of it? Yeah, Right to Dream is a one-of-a-kind enterprise on the planet that started in Ghana almost 25 years ago, where a youth academy organically happened because of a brilliant man, Tom Vernon, and his wife. They took in a bunch of kids, started an academy in their home with a commitment towards football, education, and character. So they've developed some of the best players, young players now in Europe, playing in the Premier League and, and in major leagues in Europe. And then Right to Dream expanded into Denmark. They operate one of the best teams in Denmark, FC Norgeland. And last year it was the youngest team in the world and a real focus on youth development. So they give top young talent major minutes early and they win doing it in Denmark. So they then expanded into Egypt and just two weeks ago launched the one of its kind academy in Egypt that's dedicated its full residential it's a commitment to kids at age 10 and 11 and the kids that aren't good enough or choose to not go on the professional pathway. They make a full commitment on the educational pathway and all those kids come over to America on prep school and go on to college scholarships and so on. We're doing the same thing now in San Diego. We're going to have a right to dream Academy. We're going to do a groundbreaking November nine and we will service all the underserved in our region, and our region includes across the border into Tijuana. So we're gonna have a blended academy, the best young 12 year olds from America, from Mexico, blended together, same commitment. The best of the best soccer wise go on to a professional pathway. Those that wanna go on an educational pathway, we take care of them through that. And it's football, character, and education. Those are the three pillars. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a very interesting operation. Um, do you think that there will be an, any opportunities for players from some of those clubs to be also uh, integrated into your first team? Or what, how does the knowledge share element of it go into kind of helping you grow your team? Yeah, that's 100% the idea with our club is to home grow as much of our talent as we can through our family of academies. So Ghana, Egypt, Denmark, here in San Diego, as we mature in the in the future, you would see a blend of the best of the best coming up to FC Norgeland, the, the club in Denmark, coming up to San Diego FC, and whether whatever other clubs we might add to the Right to Dream network over time. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but the objective of Mr. Mansour, our owner from Egypt, who's the primary owner of uh, Right to Dream, is to give all of this back. This is a non-for-dividend situation where he wants to take whatever comes from this and reinvest it in more opportunities for youth because right to dream truly changes lives whether it gives the kids who have no chance the pathway to the pros or it gives them the pathway to the ivy league and the best universities in america it's pretty awesome so finally you guys are the 30th MLS team. In American sports, 30 teams is kind of the sweet spot for where most leagues really kind of cap off at. Um, how do you now see MLS going into the future economically, socially? Just it feels as if this is maybe a moment where we look at the league and say 30 teams. OK, maybe this is where we are at this point. How do you see the league now going forward? That's a bigger question than for me, right? That's a league wide question. There are professional leagues here with 32. So uh, it's 30 or 32. Um, look, the reason you don't expand more is usually because you dilute the talent pool is one concept, right? 
And what's interesting with where we sit in the global talent scale, uh, we're not top of the top, right? That's over in Europe. Uh, we're in that next tier. So there's plenty of talent to go around from the global talent pool to allow more expansion. That's a board of governors decision that was is now been announced that they would wait until maybe after the World Cup to determine what to do. As far as where MLS goes, I mean, MLS is on a rocket ship right now. When you talk about the Messi booster and the World Cup booster that's coming, you put those two things together and this thing is on fire. So you have to really see where the league is going to be after 2026. You probably saw the League's Cup competition, which was mm -hmm. one of a kind where Liga Mex and MLS each paused their regular season to play a World Cup type tournament between two leagues never happened anywhere in the world it was so cool Messi came right at that point captured the attention of the whole continent and we really see that growing and evolving as an important competition innovative interesting and hopefully all of North American soccer is rising in the global consciousness and competitiveness and of course with the way they're bringing the global uh Club Cup here, the FIFA competition is going to be in America. There's just more eyes on America over the next couple of years, and we're really excited to play a small part in that as we uh, ride the wave and ride the rocket ship. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Congratulations on all your guys' success so far. Wishing you guys the best, and uh, congratulations, and you know, looking forward to see where San Diego goes from here. All right. Thank you.